10.9. Matchita matkata prana bodayanta parasparam katayantas jamam nityam tusyanti charamanticha. Translation by His Divine Grace A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami Prabhupada. The thoughts of my pure devotees dwell in me. Their lives are fully devoted to my service and they derive great satisfaction and bliss from always oh, very good. and they derive great satisfaction and bliss from enlightening one another and conversing about me i picked this verse today because there are so few of you here today that it made me remember a statement made by our spiritual master, Srila Prabhupada. One time, we arranged a program for Prabhupada, and unfortunately, only four people attended. So, we became very worried that Prabhupada would be displeased with us, that so many people had not come. He said, why? He said, my Guru Maharaj, said that if no one comes, then we can speak to the walls. Anyway, he said, I think that many have come. Didn't you see Narad Muni, Lord Shiva and Lord Brahma? We said, no, Srila Prabhupada, we didn't see them. He said, they were there. They were certainly there. Because wherever Hari Katha is going on, all of the great personalities attend to here. So, this is mentioned here as a quality of a devotee, that they derive great satisfaction and bliss from always enlightening one another and conversing about Krishna. Ah. The word bliss, ananda, is different than sukha. We say, Sukha dukkha, happiness and distress. That sukh is not the same as ananda. Ananda is bliss, which has no comparison with any happiness in this material world. Uh, param ananda, the supreme happiness, is what? Ananda moya biasat. Krishna is the personification of ananda. God is the source of all happiness. Uh, the word Rama means the reservoir of all pleasure. When we chant Hare Krishna, Hare Rama, as Krishna means, the word Krishna means all attractive. He who can attract everyone or everything. Rama means he who gives pleasure to everyone. The source of pleasure. Now, why is Krishna the source of pleasure? Because he has all good qualities within him. We become pleased to meet someone who is very beautiful, very knowledgeable, very wealthy or famous. Krishna has these and other qualities more than anyone in existence. So he is all attractive and all pleasing. Coming into his association gives us a sense of fulfillment. Bhaktivinoda Thakur has prayed, Manasa Deha Geho Yo Kichu Mur Api Lun Tua Pade Nanda Kishore. My dear Lord, I consign, I give to you everything. Manasa, my mind. Deho, my body. Geho, my what? Family. Huh? My home. Yo kitchen more, everything I assign to you. Now, normally in the material world, if you give someone your mind, your body, your family, and your home, you are left with nothing. You're the biggest loser in the world. You're a fool because you have nothing left. But here, Srila Bhakti Vinodhakra says, Api Luntua Pade Nanda Kishore. My dear Nandikishore Krishna, I am giving you everything. Uh, why? Why does he say this? Because he sees that 
uh, as it is said, Mamai Vamsha Jiva Loke, Jiva Bhuta Sanatana. I am a part of you. You are the whole, I am your part and parcel, and I cannot be happy separated from you. When I keep my mind, my body, my family, my home separate from you, I feel incomplete. You are the whole, I am a part and parcel. When everything that I have is in your service, then we become complete. And this makes us happy. We are now feeling something is missing. Everyone, Prabhupada says, is searching for some type of happiness or love. When we come to Krishna, that sense of uh, being unfulfilled becomes satisfied. Uh, Bhakti Vinod Thakur prays, Janaka Janani Dahita Nthanai Prabhu Guru Pati Tuha Sarva Moi. He says that, my dear Krishna, you are my father, you are my mother, you are my lover, you are my son, my lord, my preceptor, my husband, you are everything to me. Now we are trying to do fulfillment of all of these in separate people. We have our husband or our wife, our father or mother, son or daughter. We have all of these relationships reposed on different people. But still you have to admit, I'm not perfectly happy. Why? Because we cannot say that our husband or wife is eternally our husband and wife. You cannot say that your son or daughter is eternally your son and daughter. You cannot say that any of these relationships can last beyond this body. But in Krishna we find an eternal relationship, an eternal partner. And that is why Shastra tells us that while you are going along in material duty, which is called Dharma, you must also do Sanatana Dharma. While you are filling all of the other Dharmas, you must also be building your Sanatana Dharma. Because by the end of life, can you take your bank balance with you? Can you take your, your Rolls Royce or Mercedes or Cadillac with you? Can you actually take your family members with you? Where are your family members from your past life? Today you have come with your family, your husband, your wife, your children. What about your husband and wife and children from your past life? Did you bring them with you? Where are they? I would like to meet them. Why am I saying this? Not to make you feel upset. I don't want you to think that this sannyasi is our enemy. But a sannyasi is supposed to be a sadhu. What does sadhu mean? Sadhu means someone who carries a very sharp knife. Now you can see that it means he's a very dangerous person. He's carrying a weapon. <laughs> Yeah, he's a very dangerous. A sadhu is the most dangerous person of all. In some places they think that they should be banished. We should banish sadhus. This was the idea uh, of, uh, what is his name? Uh, he wanted to banish Narad Muni. Uh, Daksha Maharaj. Uh, Daksha Maharaj. He said, this Narad Muni is our enemy. I had so many thousands of sons and he cut them. He used his weapon. He cut the, the, the cord that connected me to my children and therefore he's my enemy. So a sadhu means one who does what? Cuts. What does he cut? What? Does he, the skin? No. He cuts our attachments. He cuts our attachments. Now you may say, well, that's not very nice. I've worked very hard to get my home. I've had my marriage for, you know, 29 years or 35 years. What right does he have to cut them? He may have, he, you may not let him cut them, but there's something, someone who will surely cut all of these things. What is his name? Huh? Kala. Who is Kala? Kala Shakti. The time factor. Time. Krishna says, time I am, and I have come to, what, give everything, take away everything. 
Now you may say, this is a very depressing thing. This is my one day off in the week and I have to come here and hear all of this depressing talk about losing, taking away, cutting. <laughs> well, let us say this. When you, you see, when you have a toothache, let's say you have a toothache. So you have some germs in your tooth. Now when the dentist operates and he removes the germs, do you tell him, why are you taking this away from me? No, you thank him, you pay him. Because these germs were not wanted and now I feel relief. So the cutting of a sadhu is meant to give you relief. What is the cause of our being upset? Why are we feeling pain? Because of our attachment. Somehow we are attached to something, a conception. So the sadhu, with his sharp words, cuts our attachment to material life. Now, if you let go of something, Chanaka Pandit has said, do not pick up one foot until you have the other foot firmly planted. Don't just take your one foot off the ground until your other foot is firm on the floor. So, if a sadhu is cutting your attachments, then he should also be giving you a superior attachment to something better. In the Gita we see, it says, that Param Drishtana Vartate, that you may have many attachments, and you may try to free yourself from them, and you won't be successful. But if you get a superior attachment, then it becomes very easy to become detached. Now, what is the most superior attachment that you can think of? That is Krishna. A sadhu is one who gives us Krishna. He is one who introduces us to Krishna, who brings us very gently by the hand, sometimes begging. Prabhupada quotes a verse which I don't remember exactly the wording, but it says, My dear sir, I am approaching you with straw in my mouth. He says, you are a very great sadhu. He says, you are very great. He's, the sadhu is going to another man. He said, you are a very great sadhu. And I am approaching you with straw in my mouth. Because you are very learned. You are very uh, wise and renowned. See? So I am therefore pleading with you. Because you are such a great and magnanimous person. Please take the mercy of Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. And whatever else you know, kindly forget it. You're such a great sadhu, I'm begging you with folded hands, please now forget everything you have ever heard and just get the mercy of Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. That means take Krishna. So this is not an easy job to be a sadhu. Because we have to go to people and beg. As Nityananda Prabhu and Haridas Thakur begged. Because in this day and age, people do not want to see a sadhu. In Hong Kong, where I often go, if you meet a monk, if a Chinese person meets a monk on the road, it means certainly there will be bad luck that day. At least this is what they think. <laughs> now it should be the opposite, that when you meet a sadhu, you should think, now you made my day. You see, in America they say, right, you made my day. But in Hong Kong they say, you have spoiled my day. According to, uh, uh, according to the Chaitanya Chaitamrita, it is stated, or Chaitanya Bhagavad, that the further west you go from Navadvip Dham, Navadvip means birthplace of Mahaprabhu, Lord Chaitanya, which is in Bengal. The further west you go, the more and more materialistic the people become. Now actually we can see this as a fact. If you start out, we'll jump out of India because we don't want to offend anyone, <laughs> starting from Bengal towards Western India. We'll say, leaving India, we start off and we go into the Middle East. And actually, even if we say that the Muslims do not appreciate the Hindus, still they're very staunch in their belief, isn't it? Sometimes they're too staunch. If we criticize them, we say, you're too religious. We say, please calm down. But nobody says they're not religious, they're fanatically religious. So they're still strong. 
Then you go to Europe and it starts to become very materialistic. But when you go to America, Europeans look quite cultured. Compared to Americans, even the Europeans always say about Americans that there's, you know, they're like, it's the Wild West. Not only about Texas, all of America. Now when you go out of America and you go further west, it gets more materialistic. Certainly the Japanese are experts in materialism. They have surpassed America. Isn't it true? They have beat them in automobiles, beat them in what? Computer technology, right? I mean, they're always outdoing them materially. Then you go further west and you come to the Chinese, who are certainly the most materialistic of all people. Now you may say, why do you say that? Because in the whole history of China, in all their philosophies, they don't have a conception of a personal God. Their great religious person, Confucius, was not a great religious person, he was a moralist. He taught good morals, do good to others, do this, do this, but about God he said very little. So, as we go west, we find more and more materialism. So nowadays this materialism has engulfed the whole world. To be a sadhu in today's world is a very thankless task. Thankless task. Still we are trying our best. We are not sadhu, but we are trying to serve a sadhu, Srila Prabhupada. You consider how daring Prabhupada was. He came here with 40 rupees in his pocket. At that time, 40 rupees was equal to five dollars. The rupee was eight rupees and a dollar. Now, how many rupees in a dollar? Anyway, about, it goes, it fluctuates, but it's about four times weaker than it was. So Prabhupada got 40 rupees and he had a, bo he had a box of his books. And who was to meet him? One man who was a son of somebody he knew from India. And they took him out to Pennsylvania and he had to live in their home. They were meat eaters. But Prabhupada would cook on his own. He would cook sabjis and puris and feed them. And he would deal with the family very nicely. He gave a few lectures and then he thought, this is no use here. This is Butler, Pennsylvania. No, but it's not even on the map. <laughs> So he thought, I have to go to New York City. Who was in New York City? Nobody. Didn't know where he would live. He went there to New York City. He moved into some office, living in an office that someone gave him. Not even a residence. One day, everything he had was stolen. He got a typewriter because he was still writing his books. It was stolen. Practically everything stolen. Then he moved down into the lower part of Manhattan called the Bowery where only bums, drunks, are living. He was a, you have to understand, the most perfect sadhu, the most wonderful sadhu, just like fire covered by smoke. Prabhupada was like this, living there and just to get into the place, someone offered him a loft to live in. And to get into the loft, every day Prabhupada had to step over drunks, men who were drunken. And the man he was staying in the loft with, he was a, he was a drug addict. One day this man took some massive quantity of drugs and became crazy and wanted to kill Prabhupada. Prabhupada grabbed his manuscript and everything, raced out of the house. And he was simply walking the streets of New York. Nowhere to live, no money, nothing. Now we're sitting in this temple. It's, the air conditioner is almost working. <laughs> we're almost cool. But we're enjoying ourselves quite all right. We may have our complaints occasionally, but more or less we're satisfied. And this temple is duplicated all over the world. There must be hundreds of temples of ISKCON like this everywhere. But please understand that there was a time in 1965 when only Prabhupada was walking and there was nothing. One day Prabhupada sat down on a park bench in New York with nobody, no money, nothing. He just sat there. And some man walked and sat next to him. And he started to talk to this man. How do we know this? Because after Prabhupada left this world, when Satsarupa Maharaj was writing the biography, somehow we found this man. And this man said that one day a sadhu sat next to me. He didn't say a sadhu. He said someone, an old Indian gentleman, 
wearing robes, sat down next to me. And he described a big movement with hundreds of temples and farming communities and schools and deities inside the temple. And he turned to me and, he, and the man said to he said he asked Prabhupada at that time, he asked him, uh, where are all of these things? And Prabhupada said, they all are there, but only time is separating them. Prabhupada could see all of these things that would happen. But at that time, there was only him. Most of you may not have been here yet in 1965. Many of you, maybe we weren't born or you had not come. Many of you are from India, had not come yet. There were not so many people from India at the time and there were certainly no other temples. We had a monopoly. We didn't have a monopoly. We had no temple either. But we, were, we got a monopoly for a while. Now there are so many temples. At that time, there were none. And certainly about Krishna, nobody knew anything. And Prabhupada began. He finally decided, I will sit inside a park. He sat down in a park, chanted Hare Krishna. And so many young people came and he began to talk about Krishna. And they had never heard such nice words from a sadhu. They had never met a sadhu. That is the real point. They had not met a sadhu. And by the association, it is said, a, a one, what, uh, what is that word? Lava matra. One eleventh of a second is lava matra. One eleventh of a second of association with a sadhu is enough to change your life. And that happened. People's lives became changed. And the rest is history. How the Hare Krishna movement started. So, a sadhu makes you give up your material attachments by giving you something better. And what is that better thing? Krishna. Certainly Krishna is better than all the material attachments that we can find in this world. More attractive, more wonderful in all ways. Otherwise, why is it that so many great personalities have sacrificed even up to their life for Krishna? You see how all the great personalities in Vedic history, how they have given up everything. Just like we worship Hanuman. Why? Because he gave everything for Ram. Each person that you name, if we go through Bali Maharaj, how he gave up his whole kingdom of the whole universe for Vaman Avatar. Prahlad Maharaj, how he was willing to sacrifice everything for Sri Nishingadev. Arjuna, the famous Pandava, and his brothers and Kunti, how they were willing to do everything and anything to please Krishna. So we know of Hanuman, we know of the Pandavas, we have heard the glories, the Mahima of all of these persons. Now shouldn't we feel some inspiration? Shouldn't we also become similarly inspired? Yes, let me follow Hanumanji. Let me follow Bali Maharaj. Let me follow Garuda. Let me follow Arjuna and his brothers. Let me follow all of the great bhakts. As they have done now, let me surrender. And Krishna says the same thing. And Bhaktivinoda Thakur has sung the same thing. Manasa deha geo yo kichumor. Apilun pada dua pada nanda kishor. Give up all these things to Krishna. This is how you do it. Now what does it mean to give up to Krishna your body, your mind, your family, your everything? What does it mean? It means to offer them to Krishna. And what does Krishna do? He gives them back to you in a better way. When you offer your body to Krishna, he doesn't make you die. He gives the body back to you in a better condition. When you offer your mind to Krishna to think of him, what does he do? He doesn't make you go crazy. He makes your mind full of ananda, full of bliss. When you offer your husband, your wife and your children to Krishna, what does he do? He makes them so much more wonderful that your love for them increases. So what does it mean to surrender everything to Krishna? It means to bring Krishna into everything. This is what we should see. You should invite us to your home and you should say, Sadhu, oh Sadhu, please come in my home 
and Krishna eyes everything for me. Just like a person with a magic wand. You please come and touch your wand. This is a, this is a sadhu, sadhu wand. Please touch this on the head of my son, on the head of my daughter, onto my house and everything I own, even my car. <laughs> touch it to everything and make it Krishna iced. So that whatever I am doing, wherever I go, I can always remember Krishna. This is really what it means to become Krishna conscious. It doesn't mean you have to become a sannyasi putting on saffron and wandering here and there around the planet. It means that wherever you are, whatever you're doing, you add Krishna. Now how will we remember to do this? How will Krishna give us the intelligence to know how to do this? Therefore, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu says, chant Harinam. Harinama, Harinama, Harinama eva kevalam kalua nasteva 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 gatir anyataha. Just do Harinam. When you're driving your car, do Harinam. When you're walking to school, chant Harinam. When you're cooking in your kitchen, chant Harinam. Whatever you're doing, add Harinam. And what will be the result? Then Harinam. Krishna himself is Harinam. Nama Avatar. In the Kali Yuga, the name is Krishna and Krishna, Nama Nami No. There's no difference. Krishna's name and Krishna are not different. So how do you add Krishna to everything? Harinama, Harinama, Harinama Eva Kevalam. And Krishna will give you intelligence how to go from there. He will show you more and more. So many of you come here every Sunday. I recognize your faces very well. But somehow you are escaping the sadhu's knife. You are coming here with the same cord still strongly tied. So I have concluded that my knife is not very sharp. Better to give you the knife and you cut. You see? Then you won't be angry with me. So I want to give you the knife, you cut the knot. You chant Harinam and everything else will happen. That is my request. So now our Pujari must be there. There he is. Sukhananda Das. You see, our Pujari, his name is Sukhananda. I told you we are not just talking of Sukh, but Ananda. This is Sukh and Ananda. He has really got happiness. Why? Because he's always serving Sri Sri Radha so, the RT ceremony is soon to begin and this will be your chance for some cutting. I'm going to give you all the means to cut the knot, which is Harina. When we do the RT here in the Hare Krishna temple, what is the main thing we will do? Not only we will watch the RT, but with our lips we will glorify Krishna. We must learn Rishi Kesha, Rishi Kenam, Sevanam, Bhakti Uchate. Our tongue, our lips here, our eyes, our ears, and with our hands, all the senses, we shall use them in serving Rishikesh. Krishna's another name is Rishikesha, the master of our senses. So during the RT, you should use all your senses in the service of Rishikesh. With your eyes, see Krishna. With your tongue, chant Krishna's name. With your ears, hear Krishna's name. With your nose, if you have a very strong nose and you are up front, smell the agarvati that has been offered to Krishna. And with your touch, clap your hands and chant Hare Krishna. So now we shall request everyone to stand up and we will have Sri Sri Radha Kalachanji's Arti. Go pray manandi hari hari haribo